Before there was science, there was alchemy. Science was born of this quasi-mystical practice, which was deeply rooted in ancient philosophies. The word chemistry is derived from the word alchemy, but their methodologies and goals were entirely different. Alchemy was secretive. Its practitioners, called alchemists, kept any discoveries hidden from their rivals and wrote of their experiments only in arcane mystical symbols. For science, the pursuit of knowledge is its own goal, but for alchemy, it sought to discover the Philosopher's Stone, a magical substance that was believed to have the power to transmute lead into gold and according to some, even confer immortality on its owner. Of course, it was a fruitless quest, and the searching for this mystical substance prevented much real progress for many centuries. That was the world Robert Boyle was born into, and that was the world Robert Boyle would help to change. Robert Boyle was born in 1627 in Lisburn Castle in the south of Ireland, near Cork. His father was the first Earl of Cork, a prominent figure in the English colonization of Ireland. His family was wealthy, English and Protestant. The people outside the castle were poor, Irish Gaelic speaking and Catholic. But Robert was not inflicted with the prejudices that closed the minds of others of his privileged class. Young Robert was interested in the pursuit of truth. From boyhood, Robert was very religious. This representation at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin is believed to be Robert as a boy, kneeling in prayer. When he was 12 years old, his father sent him to continental Europe to advance his education. Three years later, while visiting Florence, Italy, the famed astronomer Galileo Galilei died. While there is no evidence that the two met, his death triggered an intense interest in studying his work. This was one of the things that helped Robert Boyle develop a passion for the sciences. Back in England, Boyle met with other like-minded people with an interest in a new approach to the natural sciences. People like Robert Hooke, who became his research assistant and who himself became a prominent scientist, pioneering the field of microscopic researcher. This group of like-minded individuals called themselves the Invisible College, and they were dedicated to what they called the New Philosophy. In time, the Invisible College became the Royal Society, which exists still, an organization devoted to science. They took as their motto, nothing by mere authority, meaning that they were no longer willing to accept the authority of ancient Greek philosophers. Boyle championed the use of controlled experiments to establish the facts, and he would openly publish all the details of his research. Perhaps his most famous discovery is called Boyle's Law. It describes the relationship between pressure and the volume of a gas. As pressure increases, volume decreases, and vice versa. Boyle's most famous published work is called The Skeptical Chemist which seems to be the first time the word chemist is used instead of alchemist. In his book, Boyle argues against the alchemical view of the world. Instead, he argues that particles of some kind, he calls them corpuscles, combine in various fashions to form different substances. It is an almost modern view of matter, and a great leap forward from the alchemical view that everything is composed of four elements earth, wind, fire, and water. In The Skeptical Chemist, Boyle encourages a modest approach to science. He recommends admitting mistakes and avoiding dogmatism. He cautions others to distinguish between the things that they believe to be true and the things that they know to be true. Boyle took an equally vigorous approach to spiritual matters. He felt studying the natural world was one way to understand truth. He told a friend that God would not have made the universe the way it is unless he intended us to understand it. Still, he did not believe it was the only way to enlightenment. 
he believed it is just as important to study divine revelation, which he understood to be revealed in God's Word, the Bible. But he was troubled that so many were unfamiliar with Bible teachings and had no solid foundation for their beliefs. Boyle was determined to help people deepen their knowledge of the Bible. To that end, Boyle contributed his own money to publish religious tracts and, more importantly, Bible translations in many languages that formerly were without the Bible. He paid for translations in Algonquin, the language of a North American First Nation. He also published the Bible in Arabic, Malay, Turkish, and other languages, most famously in the Irish language. Now this was controversial because it was the policy of the English colonizers to suppress the native Irish language. But this was a policy not shared by Boyle, who was one of the few English-Irish noblemen who could speak Irish Gaelic. Curiously, Boyle, like his contemporary Isaac Newton, never entirely gave up on alchemy. Still, by the time of his death in 1691, alchemy was on the way out, having been replaced by chemistry, due in no small part to Boyle's experimental work. Boyle was buried in the churchyard of St. Martin's in the Field in London, near Trafalgar Square. In his will, he left money to establish the annual Boyle Lectures. Now, the purpose of these lectures was not to promote science, but rather to defend Christianity against atheism and other forms of unbelief that even then he felt were on the rise. The annual Boyle Lectures continue to this day. Today, it is not uncommon to hear the new atheist claim that belief in God is a barrier to scientific progress. They present a false alternative, either science or faith, and they claim that each is at war with the other. This is not a conflict Robert Boyle would have recognized, nor would his contemporaries Galileo, Robert Hooke, or Isaac Newton. For Boyle, scientific inquiry served to reveal the wisdom of God. Rather than stopping his science, for Boyle and for many others, Christianity was the very engine that drove it.